and let's look at the text of Scripture that we have today. Father, we are grateful for the hope that we have in the Lord Jesus, the hope that is everlasting. We're thankful, Lord, for the grace that you've granted to us. We're thankful that you loved us. And it was not on the basis of our having first loved you, but rather you loved us and you sent your son to be the propitiation for our sins. Thank you for loving us so much that you would forgive us. Thank you for loving us so much that you would cleanse us. And thank you for loving us so much that you would give to us the great blessing and privilege of everlasting life. Thank you for the hope we have in Christ and thank you for the comfort and the joy that that gives. Lord, around this room, we have seen your grace in so many ways. Every one of us can give a testimony of how your grace has been sufficient in every need. And Lord, it's with that confidence and with that joy that we come together and look at the scripture today. And so as we open the word together, we pray that you would guide us in our, in our understanding of your word and that you would be honored in it. And we pray in Christ's name, amen. Well, you have your outlines and we are on a passage that we actually started on, I guess a couple of weeks ago, but we didn't get very far. So we're back there again. But our goal is to finish that passage today. We're actually in the second part of 1 John 4. We're looking at verses 7 through 21. And what a wonderful passage of the scripture this is. This is that passage of scripture that speaks of God as love. In, the, in this letter from John, John began in the very first chapter talking about a life. He said there, there was this life that was manifest from God. And he speaks of this as the eternal life. He said, we saw it, we, we heard him, we, we touched him. In fact, we, we studied him very carefully. And so when we speak to you about eternal life, when we talk to you about this life that's come from God, we were not only eyewitnesses, but we were students of this life. We know of what we speak. And that leads him then to speak about that life in a couple of ways. Uh, one, the quality and the nature of that life, which led him into talking about how God is light. And so when we talk about this life that was manifest among us, this life that was manifest in Jesus, it was a manifestation of light. We uh, talk about the this life as being a manifestation of the love of God. We're gonna see that in this passage that we have today, that's emphasized. He said, we saw this, we, we understood this. There is the matter of who he is. And uh, this was not just anybody. This was not just any life. This was the life which was with the Father that became incarnate and manifest among us. And so, he writes this letter because he says, I want you to know and understand the truth about this life. And in fact, you already know this because you have heard the message that was preached to you and you have the Holy Spirit of God indwelling you. And so you know this, but he said, I don't want you to be deceived by other people who are talking about this life in a different quality or talking about this life in terms of a different identity. And so those two things, the quality of the life, the identity of the life, are the key features of his passage. And that's what brings us then to verse seven. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. We have seen in this letter, John make reference to being born of God. And we have seen in this letter that for John, what that means is that there's a family, there's a family resemblance. It's not just a resemblance, but there's a, there's a genetic manifestation 
Um, there is a character that belongs to the fact that we've been born of God. The one who has been born of God manifests a life that belongs to God. And what he says is that life is manifest in terms of a love. Love is from God. Whoever loves has been born of God and knows God, and anyone who does not love doesn't know God because God is love. We looked at this a couple of weeks ago and, and noted the fact that this fits in this letter with the phrase, God is light. God is love. God is spirit. There are, there are phrases like this that speak of of God. It's not the case that love itself is God, as if we're deifying the action of love or the manifestation or expression of it, but rather God defines what love is just like God defines what light is in terms of quality and moral, moral character. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. It was God who took the initiative. It was God who loved us, who saw us and loved us. It's not because he didn't love us because we were so lovely. He didn't, he didn't love us because we were so nice. <laughs> he didn't love us because we behaved so well. He loved us even though we were sinners. Paul says this, Romans 5, 8, God shows his love in this, that even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He first loved us and he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. That word propitiation means that he satisfied his own wrath because he's holy. It's very interesting, I was reflecting on this, we've, we've made reference a lot of times to God's character that he expressed in Exodus 34 to Moses, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, forgiving, transgression, iniquity, and sin. He didn't stop there. It goes on and says, by no means will he clear the guilty. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, the children's children, the third generation, and that sort of thing. We have two aspects of the character of God. He's utterly holy. He doesn't just say, well, it's okay. Whatever. He doesn't do that. But at the same time, loving, gracious, steadfast love and mercy, and forgiving, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. But he doesn't clear the guilty, but he forgives. But he doesn't clear the guilty, but he forgives. How do those two things come together? They come together and that God satisfies his own demands. He's the one that pays, provides the penalty, that pays the penalty for our sins. And that allows mercy to express itself when our sins are paid for. And so this is what John is saying, all that is the manifestation of love. He sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Verse 11, beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. Why? Because we're born of him. And so if we're born of him, and if he loved us, then we are those who love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God is seen. 
he's seen in the love that he expresses to others when that's expressed through us. And that's where we come to this phrase, his love is perfected in us. I believe that when we were looking at this last time, that's where we stopped in verse 12 there. This phrase, love perfected in us, has been understood in some different ways. John Wesley made very popular the notion of perfect love. And in the late 18th and early 19th century, Wesleyan theology emphasized this point about perfect love. And it came from here in 1 John 4 and also in 1 John 1 where he uses this phrase, perfect love. However, he understood that, that what we're called to do is to love perfectly and that we can do that. And what we should strive to do is to reach that level of perfection where we're perfect in our loving. Now, <clears throat> striving to be godly and striving to be um, perfect in the sense of modeling ourselves after the Lord and walking in him in maturity and so on is certainly the case, but it led some people to think that um, they would re reach a stage in their Christian life where they didn't have to think about 1 Corinthians 10, uh, 12, and 13. Let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. Uh, there are temptations that come our way. But no, we've reached a level where they don't come anymore. No, we don't reach that level where the temptations don't come anymore. In fact, I don't believe he's talking here about us loving perfectly. What he's talking about is the completion of the expression of God's love. The word perfected here can also be translated completed. It's the same word. And what he's referring to is the fact that God loved us and he sent his son to die for us. And as we who are born of God, love one another, the love of God is completing itself by being expressed from us to each other. God expresses it to us personally, but then it's, it reaches another phase and completes itself as we love one another. It's not talking about how perfectly we do that. It's talking about the fact that we do that. And the more that we do that, the more that love completes its intent and expression. We're formed into a unity together by the Holy Spirit. And as we're formed in that unity, we come into fellowship with God, who is three persons in unity, one God, we're brought into a fellowship and we share a love that's expressed in God himself. That love manifests and completes itself as it's expressed between us with one another. And that's why <clears throat> John was so insistent on the fact that the one who's born of God loves. By this we know, verse 13, that we abide in him and he in us because he's given us of his spirit. And having given us of his spirit, that expresses itself in two ways for John. One is the identity. Because his spirit dwells in us, we know who Jesus is. Verse 14, we've seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. This was the point of the first part of the chapter, that you don't believe every spirit, but 
the Holy Spirit testifies to Jesus that he's the Son of God. The one in whom God dwells, the one who's born of God, confesses that Jesus is the Son of God. That's our faith. We know who Jesus is, and we believe in him. So <clears throat> we know that we abide in him because the spirit he has given to us causes us to testify that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, uh, and consequently, confessing that is coordinate with the fact that we abide in God. And also, not only do we confess that Jesus is the Son of God, but we love one another. So we've come to know and believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. And by this is love perfected with or in us, that is, by this is love completed in us, so that we have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. That last phrase, as he is, so also are we in this world. We are, that is, we live, we, our character is the character of God in the world. As he is, so are we in the world. And how is he in the world? Well, he expresses his love by sending his son to be the propitiation for our sins. We express that love to one another that is in Christ. <clears throat> and so the love of God is being completed in our care, our love for one another, our love for the lost and sharing the gospel with them, our love for one another and the body of Christ. <clears throat> and so what this does is it builds up a confidence. See the word confidence there. The confidence is mentioned about four or five times here in, the, in 1 John, where he talks about the confidence that we have. And this confidence, <clears throat> he says in 1 John 3, verse uh, 20, whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart. He knows everything. And if our heart doesn't condemn us, we have confidence before God. And here we have confidence. The confidence comes because we love one another. <clears throat> now look, the assurance of our salvation is based on the fact that our faith is in Jesus, who died for us. <clears throat> we have forgiveness of sins. We are justified in the presence of God. But the confidence grows. The confidence uh, develops in the Christian life connected with our loving one another. This is what John is teaching. <clears throat> When the love of God completes itself through us, when we love one another, there's this confidence that grows. It's just part of it. We know who we are. We, we know that, that we're his children. Now, we know that we're justified by faith. But when we live walking with Christ, loving one another, there's this confidence that grows that just there's this knowledge, this self-knowledge that we're, we're just like our Father. We're, we're just like Him. We just know that. We see ourselves behaving that way. And that confidence <clears throat> goes with us as we approach the Day of Judgment. The day of judgment. The New Testament speaks of the fact that, you know, we approach that in faith. Our faith is in Jesus who died for us. He's our justification. He's our propitiation. And so 
He's the one upon whom all our faith and hope is built. But there is also this testimony of the Holy Spirit, the abiding of the Spirit of God in the life of the believer as we walk with him, which results in a testimony. Paul talked about it in, in Romans 8, that the Spirit of God testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. We, we address God as our Father in prayer, and we think of him as our Father. We just know that he's our Father, but the Holy Spirit is testifying. There's this reinforcement. It's like resonance. Like you have a musical note, and then you have resonance on, uh, you know, in another instrument because there's just this resonating testimony. The Spirit of God and our own spirit testifying. But John says there's just this, with this there's this knowledge, this self-knowledge that comes from the fact that we know who we are. And that's connected with our behavior when we love one another. And so <clears throat> this is what he's talking about in, in approaching the day of judgment. We look at ourselves and we're like he is. <laughs> we're like he is. Now, we're also aware that we're not completely. But the expectation is, is that we're growing. We're walking. Paul uses the metaphor of walking. You walk. Okay. John uses the speaks of, of, of living and, and loving like, like, like the one who's born of him should. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. I've heard this verse used in so many ways. I, I hope you see how we're, we're coming into this verse. This verse is not saying that one should not fear God. All through the Bible, there are admonitions to fear the Lord. The Old Testament is very strong in this point, but it's not only the Old Testament, and it's not merely the Old Testament. It's not something that Christians are left behind. But what it's talking about is the fear of punishment. And the perfect love, which is love completing itself through us so that we're loving one another as God loves us, and we're doing that and we, we live like that, there is this confidence, this, this growing sense of that I'm my father's son, and that kind of thing, that kind of thing approaches the day of judgment without fear. Because you just, we know who we are. We, we know who we are. Can you, can a believer approach the day of judgment uh, fearfully? They can, okay. If they're not walking in love, according to John. Whoever fears has not been perfected in love. Perfected in love means love completing itself in the way we care for one another and we minister to one another. You, you do that, you just practice doing that, and there's this, this together with your faith, there's this self-knowledge confidence. We love because he first loved us. It all comes from him as initiative. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. He who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must love his brother also. What John is developing here is what Jesus taught. We've mentioned this in that upper room of the Gospel of John, John 14, 15, 16, right at the end before the cross, John 13, where Jesus spoke to them 
as he's getting ready to go to the cross of the new commandment that he gave them, they should love one another as, as he had loved them. And he also spoke there of abiding in him. And as you abide in him, he abides in you. John here speaks of God abiding in us and our abiding in God. And we do this when we keep his commandments, he says in 1 John 2. God abides in the one who keeps his commandments. I've heard 1 John often spoken of in terms of, you know, faith and works. Uh, where does assurance come? Does it come from faith or does it come from works? But John is more specific than that. He's talking about faith and he's talking about love. And the works there, the commandments of God, are all summed up in this, that we love one another. That's why in chapter 3, he says, verse 23, And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in them. And by this we know he abides in us by the spirit he has given us. It's a matter of believing and loving. Uh, and in that loving one another, which is the summation of all the commandments, Jesus said this, Paul said this, the New Testament says this, all those come together and I'll love one another. There is this growing confidence in the believer. There is an assurance that comes from faith, Romans 5.1, now that we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God. But together with that peace that comes from the faith of justification comes this growing confidence that grows with self-knowledge of the one who walks with the Lord. And that growing confidence and self-knowledge in the love of Christ does several things. Not only produces confidence in our walk and our relationship to him but it affects our prayers uh, this is what he says uh, when he talks about uh, that we have <clears throat> what we ask of him in 1 John 3 uh, he says that um, uh, that with, with whatever verse 22 whatever we ask we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. We'll see this repeated again in chapter 5. And it's what Jesus spoke of in John 15, that abiding in him is connected to our prayer life. We pray those who abide in him and he in them, there is this effect where he changes them, he changes their mind he changes their heart, he changes their will, and it affects the prayer relationship with God so that we have what we ask of him. <clears throat> we'll talk about that a little more when he brings it up again in 1 John 5. But this is the interconnectedness of the Christian life. John is <clears throat> concerned in this letter because there are people <clears throat> who are saying different things about Jesus. There are people who claim to speak for and about Jesus who do not manifest the life, John says, which we saw, which we heard, which we examined. And he said, and we're telling you that what, what we saw, what we heard, what we examined, what we studied, <clears throat> was this manifestation of the love of God it was a manifestation of the forgiveness of our sins in the person of the one who is the eternal Son of God. So if you hear any other theology about Jesus, are you hear any or you see any kind of model or example of a life other than that, 
That's not it. And his concern is the church know and walk according to the faith that has been proclaimed by the apostles of Jesus. Well, that is our passage. There are many things, other things in here, but we want to take some time to look at questions or comments that you might have and follow any line of inquiry or observation that you might make out of this passage. Could be that you wondered about something that I've said and maybe that's not real clear. I'm happy to talk about that further. So your comments, your observations, your questions. Steve? While we were going through this, I was thinking how this really highlights why we have the division that we have in our world and in our country today. It's so different now from when I was a young boy. And it shows the need to spread the gospel, to speak the truth, to stand up. But the world doesn't want to hear the truth. It's quite a battle. Mm -hmm. The unifying love comes from God. It comes by an action of the Spirit of God. All this about love here and the unity that it creates <clears throat> among believers. Remember, he says in 1 John 2.15, this is not the love of the world. The world's love doesn't come from God. It comes out of the world. And what does it produce? <clears throat> it produces division, as you mentioned. Faction, strife, discord, conflict. Even when it uses the word love. Barbara? Uh, when, uh, when John speaks of judgment, it's on... Uh, Christian going to be judged? Is that sort of like synonymous with evaluation? Or is it, like, because it says it's not punishment? Yeah, it, it? yeah. This is a good question, Barbara. <clears throat> and what you have to keep in mind, you're putting the whole New Testament together. Uh, we, we're familiar with what Paul said in Romans 8 1, that there is now no condemnation for those of us in Christ Jesus. The spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free. And so there's, there's no condemnation. <clears throat> uh, Jesus said in John 5, he said um, that whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and he, does, he has already passed out of the judgment. So the judgment that leads to condemnation, the, the judgment that leads to eternal condemnation, we are freed from that by the death of Jesus that paid the penalty for our sins. That's the propitiation. There's the satisfaction. So the penalty has been paid. But the New Testament speaks of the fact that we all, as believers, will be before the judgment seat of Christ. This is 2 Corinthians 5, where he says we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. This is not the judgment that condemns to hell, which we have been already uh, redeemed from. But it is a standing before the master at the beginning of the kingdom in which the, traditionally in theology, we've talked about this as the rewards. I, the only problem I have that is that it, it, it sounds to many people like it's just an ice cream party, you know. Uh, and it is not, it's not an ice cream party, all right? 
uh, we all stand before him and there is a determination of uh, well, Paul spoke of it in 1 Corinthians 3. He says the day that's coming will test everyone's works. Even though a person is saved, the, what they invested their time in and their work in and what they did may be destroyed by the coming of the day of God. And so what we look for is to invest ourselves in those things that are eternal. Now, we do that when we do what John tells us, and that is we love one another. We care for what we minister to one another. And as we do that, we are actually contributing to the growth of the body of Christ. We encourage one another to grow in the Lord. These things we do <clears throat> are things that all come before the evaluation in 1 Corinthians 5, or 2 Corinthians 5, the judgment seat of Christ, where we're brought before him. And then we're ushered into his kingdom, and he appoints us in the places where, where we will be. All right. So there is that. What uh, happens, however, is that the, the less we're involved in <clears throat> in serving him in loving one another in John's terms in serving the Lord and the ways in which he has appointed us the less we're involved in that uh, the less that there is at that great evaluation and that what happens personally in a person's life we might say psychologically but it's actually spiritually what happens is that there is a personal internal awareness of that and that's where that fear comes up because we are talking about standing before God okay. so what does the New Testament say to us it says to us as children start walking <laughs> walk in the life that he's given to you serve one another love one another uh, that's well, that was the great commandment my commandment is you love one another as I've loved you okay <clears throat> so start doing that that's what the scripture says and as we do that there's just this growing maturity and with the maturity is a growing self-knowledge and with that self-knowledge is a growing confidence as we expect that day to come. Does that help? Is this, this the Bema Seat? This judgment of Christians? Yeah, that's what uh, in first uh, in uh, 2 Corinthians 5, it's the judgment seat of Christ is what that's referred to. Now that's different from what's described in Revelation 20, where he says, I saw this great white throne and him who is seated, uh, seated upon it, and the books, and so on, and there um, is the judgment that of the resurrected uh, that that leads to hell and eternal condemnation. Now, that's not the same thing as in 2 Corinthians 5, where it's speaking of the believers being gathered before the Lord. Gary? Thank you. Oh yeah, I, I think in Hebrews 10, it kind of makes Hebrews 10 makes the same implication where he says here, he says, uh, let us hold fast the condition of our hope. Let us consider how we how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not to take in our own assembly together, etc., etc. And then verse 26, this is where it says, so if we go on sitting willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment Etc. And part of part of what's going on in the context is that they are because of the pressure that's going on. Uh, I think a lot of people are saying, you know, we don't want to suffer the loss of ourselves. We don't want to go to prison like other believers. And therefore, I think there's a promise, not promise, a threat of judgment. It's not eternal judgment, but it's it's pretty severe. In this text, I think it's pretty severe. And, and it is uh, severe, and in Hebrews, I think, you know, what the thing that we have to recognize there is that we're dealing 
with a situation, especially among Jews, um, it's, it's a little difficult for us to understand um, because I think because of our position in time and because of the fact that we're mostly Gentiles, and especially at this time in history. But for these Jews in the first century, um, you know, some of them were alive before Jesus was born. Uh, many of them are hearing the message of this person who, was, who came from the Galilee and was crucified by the Romans. And they're being told that he's the Messiah. And, you know, <laughs> some of them are thinking, yeah, you know, and they're, well, I, you know, they're kind of not real sure. And, and some of them are responding, but you know, do they really believe? And that's where I think you have to keep in mind this earlier chapters in Hebrews that says, we want you all to come to the full assurance of faith. And uh, from the writer's standpoint, who is it exactly who truly believes? Well, he doesn't know, but what he's saying is we want you all to come to that. If you don't come to that and you say, look, I, you know, I think I'm just staying with the temple, okay? I, I don't need, I don't need what Jesus did. What, what, you know, what's happening spiritually in the life of that person? You know, we're not, we don't have the kind of microscopic lens to see exactly what's all we hear is the profession and the confession of faith. And so he's, he's exhorting them to come to the full assurance of faith. When we get to chapter 10, I think we're dealing with that problem along with the fact, as you mentioned, Gary, that there is a suffering that's coming upon the, the believers. And some of them are not really solid in their faith. Some of them are toying with the idea. They think it's a good idea and they want to be part of the fellowship and so on, but is he really God? And uh, am I putting my eternal salvation, my acceptance before God fully upon Jesus when I've been trained and all my ancestors have been trained to trust God offering the sacrifices in the temple? There's a point where one has to come and realize what Hebrews argues in Hebrews 7, 8, 9, that there is this one high priest. There has been a change in the law. He is the eternal high priest who has achieved for us the sacrifice that removes sin for all time and this is where you come to chapter 10. There is no other sacrifice. You walk away from that, there is no other sacrifice. The blood of bulls and goats will not take away sin, he says in Hebrews 10. So there is an issue here that we have to recognize is particularly going on among this group of people. Yeah. But I, but I would, I would comment, and I, I think you would agree, that, in, that, that for the Gentile in, in much of the New Testament, in Romans, in Romans 12, you know, when you go through chapters 1 through 11, we are given a divine privilege, especially as Gentiles. And when you look at 1 John, 1 Peter, whatever book you look at, we as Gentiles have been, you know, I mean, we bypass the law, we go right to Christ. And so, so when we when we look at the New Testament as Gentiles, we are children of God. When you go to Psalm 82, you know we have been given divine right and privileges. And so when you get to First John, all he's saying is that you are you are children of God. You have a divine responsibility. And when you are not loving your brothers and sisters in Christ as Christ loved us, there is there's there is a punishment coming. I mean, that's pretty serious stuff. 
I mean, what, what was true for the Jew and Hebrews is true for us in First Corinthians. And where John gets on it, particularly in First John uh, two, or rather in First John three, that's that wonderful passage where he says, uh, you know, look at the love that the Father has given us that we should be called children of God, and we are, and uh, we are God's children now. Uh, but he goes on to say we need to live in such a way uh, in verse chapter 2 verse 28 that we don't shrink from him and shame at his coming uh, and we're not going to do that if we walk with him and if we love one another that's his message yeah <clears throat> The impression I got was that it isn't enough to just receive God's love, but the, the action of passing it on. Right. And there's a catchphrase from Hollywood that didn't come out of the scripture, I'm sure, <laughs> but pay it forward. Mm -hmm. You know, if somebody does a good deed, you know, you ought to just kind of poop it up. Well, there is that. Uh, what we have to be careful of is that, uh, because this is what theologically we have fought with for centuries, and what we have achieved here is an understanding that our salvation has nothing to do with any merit. There is nothing, so we can't we can't purchase it in that sense. We're we're not we're not meriting our salvation. There's nothing we can do to do that. However, the best way to cast it is to go from a commercial or economic view of our relationship to God to a familial view. And this is where uh, we're children of our Father. And, you know, at the, at the family gathering <laughs> where, you know, we're brought because we're at maturity now, and we're going to be brought into the inheritance. He's bringing us into the inheritance. But, you know, as a father, what I expect is my children to show some wisdom. Okay? And, and, I, and I want to see, you know, my values and, and my, um, you know, understanding, my way of doing things reflected in them. And that's going to be taken into account when I put them in charge of things, okay? And I, and I think that if we come on that familial side of understanding, this is getting closer to what John is talking about. Uh, and that's where that, you know, that, that judgment comes in. It comes in in the sense of the father determining, you know, what is going to be granted is we come into the kingdom that he's prepared for us and our confidence about that and our happiness about that begins now as we walk with him and as we serve him this is i think what john's trying to get at in here well we come to the end of our time here and we will be in 1 John 5. You may have wondered why, you know, are we ever going to get to the end of this letter? We are. We're getting into the last chapter next week. So uh, we will look forward to that. Well, let's pray together. Father, thank you for the wonderful grace of the Lord Jesus. And thank you for the instruction that you give us from the Scripture. Help us as we seek to understand it. Lord, thank you for the wonderful blessing that you loved us, that you sent our, your Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Thank you that you loved us, that we should be called children of God. Grant by your Holy Spirit that you have made to dwell in us, that we walk with you and manifest the character of God in our love for one another and our service for you as we go through day by day. May the Lord be honored in it all, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.